Anyone fascinated by the natural world has probably wondered why some animals have such strange looking sense organs. The elephant with its huge ears. The antennae of a butterfly, which up close look like feathers. The snake with its split tongue. And what about less obvious enhancements, like the sensory cells on a crocodile's skin? Surely these evolutionary traits aren't just for decoration. In fact, the size, shape, and location of these animal sense organs is all for a purpose. And just like us, animals rely on their senses to communicate with each other, find their way around, stay safe, and most importantly, to find food. When you see how superior some animal senses are compared to those of humans, you might wonder how we ever managed to stay on top of the food chain. Animal super senses. You won't believe what's possible. On this episode of Animal Super Senses, we examine how things taste and how vital scent is from the animal perspective. You may think that there are no gourmets in the natural world. After all, animals eat for survival, not for enjoyment as we know it. So surely only humans are capable of differentiating one taste from another. Actually, it's much more complicated and interesting than that. In the animal world, the distinction between taste and scent tends to be more blurred. For example, for terrestrial animals, those that walk on land, taste is all about detecting chemicals called tastins that stimulate the sensory cells in a taste bud. But their sense of smell will also detect the scent of odorants carried through the air. In mammals, taste receptor cells are scattered all over the tongue. In other creatures, they can be located in some fairly odd places. How taste and smell receptors work underwater, well, it's a whole other world. Let's begin our journey, as it were, from the ground up with a look at snakes and their taste for a good bite. This slithery character is a rattlesnake, such as can be found across the Americas, from southern Alberta to Argentina, in a variety of habitats. The one thing that all rattlesnakes have in common with other snake breeds is their uniquely good taste. They use those famous forked tongues to gather particles from the air and identify them on a special membrane called Jacobson's organ. Put more simply, they flick their tongues to taste the scents around them. So next time you see a snake sticking its tongue out at you, Remember, it's not trying to sting you from afar, but searching for prey. Tasting their next meal before they eat it, you could even say. They have an exceptional sense of smell to begin with, but their Jacobson's organ adds a whole other dimension. The Jacobson's olfactory sense organ was actually discovered by Ludwig Jacobson, who it's named after. The organ that now bears Jacobson's name is located on the roof of the mouth in many reptiles and mammals. Mammals would include us, surely. Well, apparently, humans are an exception. Thank you. 
Now, unlike snakes and lizards, mammals that come with Jacobson's organ as standard equipment tend not to have long forked tongues that they can whip out at will to sample the air. So instead, they do something else. It's called flemining. Domestic cats do it, for instance. And so does this character, the taper. Looking a bit like a pig with a trunk, tapers actually belong to the same family as the horse and the rhinoceros. They can be found in the jungle and forest regions of Central and South America and in Southeast Asia. Tapers' eyesight isn't great, but they have a heightened sense of smell, plus the secret sensor that is the Jacobson's organ. When they curl their upper lip and look like they're sneering, the same way you have seen some domestic cats do, they're actually exposing the Jacobson's organ so they can taste exactly what's in the air. The taper is an herbivore. That long snout with a modified lip comes in handy for tearing food off branches, for example. What the leaves taste like to the taper, perhaps, we'll never know. But we do know how it finds its sustenance. Below the waterline, whether that's a pond, river, or the ocean waves, taste and scent is a whole other matter. One underwater animal who is guided by scent is this sinister and slippery looking character, the moray eel. Even though there are hundreds of species of moray, and they range in size from 25 centimeters to four meters, the menacing appearance of a moray eel with its mouth constantly agape is unmistakable. Morays are carnivores who feed on fish and invertebrates. They're also found in oceans temperate and tropical, though they thrive in the greatest number around warm coral reefs, notably in Hawaii. They have something of a reputation for aggression and what might even be called a bad temper. But actually, when they sense humans approaching, they usually flee or hide in crevices. Mind you, it's usually from these same crevices, nooks and crannies that mores launch their fatal attacks. When they do, they are led, as it were, by the nose. Mori eels' eyesight is poor, and they rely on their tube-shaped nostrils to scent and seek out prey. Fascinatingly, one of the Mori eels' preferred victims, the octopus, has evolved a chemical in its jet black ink, which is capable of neutralizing the Mori eels' powerful sense of smell. On its travels, the moray eel will quite possibly also come across the goatfish. These are also found in shallow waters, particularly in warm or tropical climes, skimming along coral reefs over mud or sand. They have twin barbells hanging underneath their chin, which must be where they got their name, as they look like goat's whiskers 
or if you're feeling particularly imaginative, like a droopy hipster's beard. Some goatfish are nocturnal and have a chameleon-like ability to change their color, but what they all seem to have in common is their hearty appetite. Goatfish spend their entire lives looking for food. How they find it is by utilizing those barbells. Goatfish are what is known as bottom feeders, skimming along looking for their next meal in the sand below. Those barbells are spotted with taste buds that will zone in on anything that's good enough to eat. For example, shrimp, crabs, clams, and clam worms. Goatfish are guided by their sense of taste and smell to their next meal, and the one after that, and the one after that. But there are some underwater animals who deploy this super sense not so much in the hunt for food, but as a sophisticated homing device. It's called natal homing by the experts. Now homing is something we associate with animals above the waterline, most commonly cats and pigeons. But it is now known that several marine animals, such as elephant seals, salmon, and sea turtles may travel considerable distances of ocean before they return as adults to reproduce. In the same natal area, they respond. Sea turtles outlive the dinosaurs, yet today, five of seven species are on the endangered species list. They also take a long time to reach sexual maturity, a decade or more. So observing them and drawing conclusions is a time-consuming and painstaking business. Sea turtles spend their whole lives at sea, except when adult females come ashore to lay eggs in the territory where they were born. The question is, how do they do it? It's thought that sea turtles find their birth beach by homing in on the chemical signature unique to where they were born, essentially tasting their way home. With these amazing abilities, that's what we call a real super sense. The case of the salmon's homing instinct is another baffler. Most salmon are born in fresh water. They migrate to the ocean, where they will spend four to five years eating and growing. At maturity, they return to breed and lay eggs in the freshwater streams they were born in. When they returned to fresh water to breed, it was assumed that salmon used the scent of the water to find their home stream. And certainly, the salmon's olfactory sense is astonishing. But now, scientists are starting to question if salmon also navigate using the Earth's magnetic field. Either way, those are some super senses the salmon deploys.
Another way in which scent is critical for animals is when it comes to marking their territory. Leaving a scent stamp on their territory, most animals don't waste a lot of time being subtle. The lion urinates on a tree to mark the boundaries of his kingdom and advise any other lions who come along that this tree is taken. The hippopotamus, however, scatters its feces to let intruders know who's in charge around here. This is called dung showering by those who study hippos and something else by anyone who happens to be around. So far, the animals we've discussed who mark their territory do so in fairly standard ways, even if, like the hippo, they tend towards the alarming. But nature's endless adaptations never fail to amaze. Take the Thompson's gazelle, which is typically found on the African savanna. The male Thompson has a particularly odd way of marking its territory. When it's mating season, they establish breeding grounds by leaving their scent in an unusual manner, secreting a smelly substance from a gland below its eye. The Thompson's gazelle sticks the stuff on grass stems to ward off male interlopers and attract females. A long way from the African plains, in the woodlands of Queensland in South Australia, you'll find one of those animals that we humans like to think of as cute. The koala, of course, is not to be confused with bears of any kind. For of course, this is a marsupial, whose closest relative is the wombat. This photogenic Aussie sleeps up to 20 hours a day and has one of the lowest brain-to-body ratios of any marsupial. If you come across one in the wild urinating on a tree, you would see it marking its territory, particularly if it was a male, like this cheeky fellow. But the male koala senses territory in other ways, too. You can distinguish the fully developed adult male koala by its quite visible chest cavity in the middle of its chest. It's actually a scent gland. And it's the scent gland on his chest that the adult male koala uses to mark his territory. Rubbing its chest against branches and twigs, usually at the bottom of a tree, produces an unusual reaction. This interesting activity triggers a particular sensation within the male koala, or buck. This sensation is accompanied by the secreting of a scented fluid that is exceptionally attractive to female koalas. When this is done, not only has the male koala marked his territory as a breeding ground, he's probably already in the mood for love. The bolus spider, also known as the angling spider, uses sex pheromones to ensnare its prey. It's known as aggressive mimicry, where a predator copies something from their prey in order to confuse or entice it. The bolus spider emits a pheromone indistinguishable from the female moth and lures male moths to their doom. It's a key weapon in the bolus spider's arsenal, as this is one spider that doesn't catch its victims in the usual web. Instead, they hunt using a sticky capture blob at the end of a line, which they swing at male moths, drenched, of course, in false scent.
Now for the final segments of the program to look at some genuine SuperSense sniffers. Let's begin with those lords of the forest, the wolf. A wolf's sense of smell is estimated to be 100 times stronger than humans. They use it to locate other members of the pack, their enemies, and of course, their prey. Scent will tell them if other wolves have been in the area, how many there were, male or female, and how recently. The wolf has several specialized scent glands on its body, including its back and about three inches from its tail. The scent it produces from these glands is as distinctive as fingerprints are to a forensic crime lab. Each and every wolf's is different. Wolves mark boundaries and trails using the smell from these highly individual scent glands. You might say their own personal calling cards. These trails and boundaries, or scent stations, can be up to 100 meters apart. Mankind has benefited from observing this behavior. As dogs have a scent ability close to that of wolves, training techniques have evolved which imitate the wolf in the wild. You can see this in search and rescue dogs as well as police and drug detection. Second of the super scent sniffers, one of the greatest noses on Earth belongs to the mighty bear. For some reason, it's gotten about that bears have poor eyesight. That's simply not true, but they rely on scent and smell even more. Their acute sense of smell helps them to track down food. For example, bears can detect a dead animal from 35 kilometers away. Smell helps bears to find mates, keep a track on rival bears, and mothers to keep track of their cubs. Bears communicate with one another using scent. By leaving scent on trees and vegetation, they broadcast a message to other bears that may be in the neighborhood. Even though a bear's brain is about the third of the size of a human's, the area of its brain, which manages smell, is at least five times larger than ours. But it's not all that cerebral, far from it. The bear's nose is quite a remarkable device. Around nine inches long for one thing, it really is all the better to smell you with. Their noses contain hundreds of miniature muscles which they can manipulate with the same ease as we might move our fingers. The surface area inside their noses is also vast by human standards and contains hundreds of receptors. And they have that Jacobson's organ in the roof of their mouth to round out this sensory arsenal. But what about the age-old question, can a bear smell your fear? The answer is yes and no. A bear can smell if you break into a cold sweat, but it doesn't register this as fear per se. So it's truer to say they can sense fear rather than smell it. On Animal Super Senses, we touch it and feel it, see it and hear it, taste it and smell it, like animals do. The senses are the star on this show, and this episode has been no exception. Taste and scent are as vital in the wild as they are in the world we've made for ourselves, maybe even more so. But these incredible powers of perception will fight again another day. So join us next time on Animal Super Senses.